In complicated structures, it can be usually highly efficient. You can cut your analysis time uh, significantly if you can identify two and three force members uh, because that will make your life a lot simpler. For instance, if you go back to example 7.2 where we had a bucket from a backhoe that was uh, then had a whole mechanical assemblage there. In analyzing all the little pieces of this, if we can identify members that are two force members, it reduces the number of unknowns significantly and helps us solve the problem quite a lot uh, more quickly than before. So that's the kind of problem that we begin to look at. Also, the trust problem of example 7.3 is another one where two force members turns out to be pretty crucial. Right? And two force members and, and three force members, in terms of their definitions, are exceptionally straightforward. They are a literal um, translation of the, of the label itself. So you could draw this in the infamous potato, but uh, and, and that's what you'll see a lot of textbooks, but oftentimes two force members turn out to be straight members that are pin connected on either end. And so when they are, are pin connected on either end, <coughs> then it'll turn out that there's one and only one possible set of uh, forces when we pull those pins. We got no applied force here on the member. We only have when we pull that particular pin. Remember pins we generally think of as having two different independent forces. Right? Pin support. But note what happens here. If I were to pin temporarily uh, after I pulled the pin, if I were to some moments at this left end, notice that I have one, two, three of those reactions that actually go through that point, leaving only this other one. And that means that other one has to be zero. And likewise, the other one that's orthogonal has to be zero. And so that means that this member has to either be in a condition where you have the two unknown forces that are left over pulling each other, pulling away, so putting the member into tension. They will have to be equal and opposite. Or, of course, they could be reversed around and be in pure compression um, as well. Now, there's another kind of interesting part of that. This is the orientation of the member in the, the sense that it does not actually need to be straight. The only real issue here is that it has only two points of connection, right? two pins. And so <coughs> there again, if we would try to pull the pin and have two orthogonal then forces to that sort of line that connects those two pins, then those got to be zero because, again, when I send moments about one end, I've got no choice. They have to, to go to, to zero. I'm going to show this one as though they're, the um, body is sort of in slight compression, but note, it doesn't have to be a straight member. There will be other things happening internally to the member because it's curved, and, and that will we will take account of at another time. But here, identify the key is we have one unknown force, but we do know the line of action. And that line of action is a straight line between the point of application of those two forces. Right. Now three force members are similar in the sense that it is a literal interpretation of the label that we got. Three force members means there's a total of three forces on the body. So now we are going to do the potato deal and we have only three forces. No couples being applied here, right? So three forces right? and we'll call them F1, F2, and F3 and in order for that to body to be in equilibrium, the sum, vectoral sum of those, has to of course be zero. And go back to what we talked about in uh, lessons <coughs> three and four, that for equilibrium, there's only one way for this to work out. And that is that you've got to then, if you do a tip to tail kind of construction here, that you've got F1, F3, and F. Sorry, wasn't really paying attention to what I got going on there. You've got instead that you had F3 going down, F2 and F1 working around 
I still don't have those quite labeled right, but you get the idea. We gotta close it all off, right? Hmm. Kind of interesting though. Take this a step further though. I mean, yeah, that okay, that's true. That those have to form that nice little triangle. And remember, we can use all kinds of nice basic geometry and trigonometry to find out what those three are. But there's something even more powerful than it is at stake here. And that is, note that we can always take these two two of these forces and find an intersection point. Right? But if I look at that intersection point, and if the third force doesn't also pass through that point, this thing's going to spin like a top. So there's something even more important here than just that we have the sum of the vector. The vector sum of those forces has to be zero. We got the tip to tail construction. There's even something more important that in order for e uh, equilibrium, that all three forces must pass through a common point. And of course we call that when that happens a very special thing that is a concurrent force system. Crucial. And, and can save us a lot of effort later on. We're going to go look at some examples now to demonstrate that.